So what we're going to do is come up with a few, let's say, relatively basic scenarios that we have for BPH. And not only are we going to do that, but also maybe talk about the basics. I think that what everyone can really take away from today is that it's not necessarily that we always have to do the biggest and fanciest things that are out there, but rather maybe we as urologists should be taking a little bit more time, maybe not shoving medicines in our patient's mouth and, and maybe trying to think about how we can intervene and provide a, a better quality of life and a better outcome for our patients. And hopefully we'll be able to provide that there are, are numerous ways in which we can kind of, or attempt to accomplish that task. So first, what we're going to talk about is just the, the very easy, and that is the 70 or the 45 gram prostate. And we're going to compare it versus medicines as well as versus the minimally invasive surgical tech, uh, technologies. I do have one disclosure and that is I'm a consultant for Teleflex slash Neotrack. So in this clinical scenario, um, we have a 55 uh, year old healthy male with an IPSS of 21. Uh, he does show that there is an obstruction on Eurocuff where he has a, a flow rate that's less than 10 um, with uh, some degree of urgency. On transrectal ultrasound, he shows a prostate of approximately 45 grams. When we take a look on the inside of his bladder, um, he's showing normal run-of-the-mill lateral lobe hypertrophy, something that you know is causing obstruction, uh, whether it be visually or, or via his symptoms or via the, the Eurocuff that was performed without any significant median lobe. Now, this patient is very concerned about being sexually active, and it's of great importance to him as well as his spouse. Now, what I would like to do is, you know, offer this out to the group, and I just want to go through how people would like to approach this patient. This is about as basic as it gets. This is by far the majority of the patients that I would say a general urologist is going to be looking at, and I would love to know um, from Dr. Sobel what he would do with this patient. Thanks. Yeah, I think the key here, uh, and, and this is something that uh, really has boiled down for my discussion with a lot of patients, is uh, whether the patient feels that it's important that they preserve ejaculation. And I think when, when, when you have that discussion with the patient, it's not up to us to decide whether that's important. Uh, it's important for us to counsel them and then uh, provide them uh, sort of with options that would fit into what's important to them. So... You know, given those findings, I would say from a medical therapy standpoint, I, I would I would offer him something like alfuzosin, um, which maybe has a lower risk of, of ejaculatory dysfunction. Steer clear of tamsulosin, particularly steer clear of psilidosin. Um, and and really, he has no true medical indications for uh, a surgical intervention. He he does not form bladder stones, retention, uh, recurrent hematuria. So you know, the the idea here is we're trying to improve his quality of life. Um, and so I would, I would steer clear of procedures at this point that would uh, impact his ejaculatory function. Um, I would tell him that uh, something that you know, I perform very frequently in laser nucleation would provide him with the longest lasting uh, effect, meaning the retreatment rate that would be the lowest, but it would come at the price of, uh, you know, and I just say 100%. It, it's not 100%, but it's so high that you can pretty much say that people are gonna likely have ejaculatory dysfunction after a thorough nucleation. So I think one of the missed therapies is a, is, is a really wonderful opportunity for that. Um, and um, whether it's prosthetic urethral lift uh, or uh, resume. So uh, we would have that discussion and see if they're, if, if they're ready to, to have a procedure or they'd like them to trial a, a, a medication. All right, I think that's a you know absolutely fantastic uh, answer. And one one thing I want to maybe focus on a little bit is that you said that he has no surgical indications in order to um, perform any additional therapies to his prostate, and that maybe medical therapy would be something that you would steer him in that direction to. And I, I can't argue with it whatsoever. Um, but I, I guess one one thing that I, I possibly would argue with is, you know, why not now? 
first of all, I, I think for this particular case, um, we're going to, you know, separate minimally invasive surgical therapies as surgical intervention. Would you say that that's the case? Or would you consider the, the, the missed therapies surgical intervention? It's, it's such a good question. I think, I think it falls between the two. I mean, the, yeah. the effectiveness is better than, than medications with a really excellent side effect profile. But it's the effect, but it's under, you know, so it's as Dr. Cranbeck said, the platinum standard laser nucleation. Sure. So, I mean, and I think where that's also important, and that is, you know, um, perception is very, very important to patients. And, and the mere fact of calling this maybe a therapy as opposed to a surgery is something that maybe will entice the patient ever so slightly, maybe in a positive way, not a misleading or not a not misguiding the patient but rather maybe encouraging them to have something that's a little bit more durable than what medicine is, that has better outcomes, et cetera. And that's what I want to kind of get into ever so slightly. Now, the way that I look at these therapies and how I talk to my patients is, I think it really has to come down to, to three things. And with those three things, I look at efficacy, how well it works, safety, how safe it is, and then the third one being bladder health. And we'll kind of go into these ever so slightly. And I, you know, for me, efficacy is not everything. I mean, for me, efficacy is really, and I shouldn't have put it for one, and obviously I did, and I apologize for that. But I think safety for me when I am presenting it to my patient is of the utmost importance in what they realize what they're getting into. And as we can get into later in this discussion, that's going to be, you know, you're going to decrease a little bit of safety for a little bit better efficacy and or longevity uh, for, these, for these procedures. So let's look into efficacy first. And um, this is pretty run of the mill stuff, uh, coming back, you know, looking at the combat trial um, where we see the QMAX is approximately 2.4 point improvement and IPSS is 6.3 point improvement which I would say is mildly generous. Um, and these are what you get with having a minimally invasive surgical therapy. And that being QMAX looking somewhere around in, in the mid threes, IPSS improvement somewhere between eight and 11, um, a slightly better IPSS improvement as well as QMAX with, with the resume. Um, this is pretty standard information. Again, I, I, I personally don't see that medical therapy has the same degree of improvement. I tend to see something, this is a, a great meta-analysis that I was able to come upon looking at a, a number of um, different studies that were performed and looking at the IPSS improvement, really hanging more around a five point improvement, which is something that I tend to also mirror as well as with the finasteride and butasteride somewhere around the four to five point improvement. And with there being improvements in their QMAX, somewhere in the twos. Now, let's look at side effects. And Nishant, how do you, how do you utilize these side effects and how you, cons how you consult your patients in regards to forms of intervention um, that you think that they may benefit from? Right, so uh, there's some pretty uh, common side effect profiles, especially for the alpha blockers, um, the, the uh, orthostasis, hypotension, dizziness, um, uh, rhinitis, there's obviously retrograde ejaculation. Um, and with finasteride, you know, I think we keep finding more and more uh, negative uh, side effects for finasteride. Uh, the decreased libido, decreased ejaculate, and then other issues, breast enlargement, tenderness, and then even some long-term um, kind of mental health disorders um, that I've, I've, you know, anecdotally seen as well, kind of a post-finasteride syndrome that even when stopping finasteride, there are still uh, some of these mental health issues going on, which is pretty scary. So yeah. with uh, the, the, the medications, I say, if you're doing you know, fine with this, these medications. Um, the side effects are tolerable. Uh, the uh, retrograde ejaculation is not bothersome, and we want a more durable response. You know, let's let's go for the the, the enucleation 
um, terpenucleation. Um, if you want to come off these medications because of these side effects, uh, the uh, retrograde ejaculation, you know, I, I lean more towards uh, a mist therapy. Resume is uh, kind of my go to mist therapy currently. Um, and the, you know, this is not a resume lecture, but it, it, it's a little bit of a buy in of three months before, uh, you know, the major effects are seen that these are happy men and they maintain their, um, you know, anti-grade ejaculation uh, and libido, I think, compared to some of the other therapies. Awesome. So I think you, you kind of went through everything that I am presenting on this slide, and that is, it's not without risk. Um, there, there definitely are side effects. At the same time, we've been using these medicines for a long, long time. I'm not a complete denouncer of medicines. I really am not. But they definitely do have a risk profile that Patients tell you over and over again how much they dislike them. And, you know, an important point that is, you know, commonly quoted in that is, you know, discontinue rates are very, very high for medicines. And they have to be high for a, for a reason. We're definitely not making it up. May it be just the inconvenience of taking a medicine? That's definitely a possibility. But I think more of it is they just don't feel the same. They don't feel right, whether it be the retrograde ejaculation, the dizziness, and, you know, just an overall not feeling the way they want to. With finasteride, I got to be honest, I rarely ever use finasteride. Uh, and maybe if it's in a very elderly person, but honestly, it, it, it's about as close to zero as it gets. It, it, it's not that it's not utilized in my practice, but it is tremendously decreased over time. So when we look at the side effects of medicines and, they, and we compare them to the minimally invasive therapies, I mean, I, I think it's really apples and oranges. Now, I, you do have side effects from the minimally invasive. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But the one thing that difference between, differs between the, the minimally invasives versus the medicines is the minimally invasive is your side effect profile. You're going to have almost immediately, and it's going to last somewhere between, I would say, one to two weeks with, with uh, the year lift. And I would say somewhere between you know, four to six weeks with, with the, the resume, depending upon, you know, size of prostate, whether in urinary retention, et cetera. And I think that's a huge difference. You know, if we're looking at these two things, we have evaluated their, their efficacy and the minimally invasives are definitely better. And if we look at their side effect profile, I think that um, also the minimally invasives are, are significantly better. And I think one thing that's very, very important to patients, and that's sexual side effects. I, I, I always tell everybody, I, I never really understood why in the world retrograde ejaculation is so important to people. I, I'm a guy, I, I think that I understand its importance, but I think I would rather not you know, wake up five times at night. But for some people and a majority of people, it's a huge, huge deal and something that we really have to respect for our patients. I and mean, if you want to compare the sexual side effects of alpha blockers and 5-ARIs versus the minimally invasives, it doesn't even come close. Now, the only thing that I'll argue is the ejaculatory function can be a little bit higher with the resume, but this is a temporary side effect. This is something that will resolve ever, over time. And their long-term data definitely shows that there's a 0% chance of any form of, of retrograde ejaculation uh, in their, you know, up to their five-year studies. So one last thing, uh, can't really um, underscore the, the types of side effects with alpha blockers, whether it be floppy iris syndrome, risk of stroke, dementia, depression and self-harm, increased metabolic syndrome, dementia, the post finasteride syndrome that's becoming more and more popular. And there is a great paper out just recently looking at the increased risk of cardiac failure in patients on long-term alpha blockade with rates of cardiac failure upwards of 20%. Now, some people will look at these studies and say, ah, oh, these studies are terrible. And some of them weren't the best study in the world. But you know what? These studies are not present with the minimally invasives. These things are not happening with the minimally invasives. So again, I think we're starting to recognize that there is some superior, uh, superiority here. And the last one is bladder health. And bladder health, I talk as the great unknown. It's something that we talk about as urologists, I think, very, very often, but I, I almost shudder to do so because there is such a paucity of data that's out there, it's very, very hard to talk about it. We do always mention um, that 
with bladder outlet obstruction, it does result in irre irreversible bladder damage if left untreated. Uh, it will progress over time. Um, 87% of men who elect watchful waiting experience worsening of symptoms over a four year period. And these are the really the only studies that we've ever had for such a long period of time. But we do recognize as urologists that in, in real life, we do see these changes. We do recognize over time that with these healthy bladders, they tend to worsen over time. There is a, a somewhat uh, recent article that looked at um, the number of patients with bladder dysfunction with persistent lower urine x-ray symptoms. They kind of tracked them from the 1990s to 2010. And what they found out that the number one presenting symptom for having a TERP in 1990 was lower urinary tract symptoms, where the number one indication for a TERP in 2010 was urinary retention. And what they're able to identify is that, you know, these patients are not as successful if you wait over a long period of time. And it's very hard not to make the assumption that over this period of time, what was very prevalent? And that's alpha blockade. And people really have to question whether alpha blockade is the cause of this progressive deterioration, this increased rates of, of, of you know, bladders that are just not working any longer, you know, rates of urinary retention that we're not able to get out of. And we don't have quite the data in order to support it, not even close, but I always question and wonder whether this is or is not the case. So if we look at, in conclusion, efficacy, minimally invasives, in my opinion, uh, are much, much better. The safety, absolutely no doubt in my mind, the safety is much, much better with these procedures. Um, again, the, the types of side effects that you experience tend to be immediately afterwards and do resolve. The long-term side effects are minimal to almost zero. And bladder health, you know, we're not all quite sure yet. If you want to talk prosthetic urethra lift versus, you know, the, the water vapor therapy or steam, um, I, I think that's a different discussion for a different time, but uh, it, it's definitely a, a good talk that I think that we can have in the future. All that being said, no head-to-head -head studies, so it's not happening anytime soon. You know, I always reference this, this kind of, uh, this last paragraph from the, the BPH guidelines in 2018, in which we had all of our great thought leaders and they came together with a, what I think was a great paragraph and I'll pick out some, some you know, good points. And that is many men are discontinu discontinuing medical therapy. And yet those people that fall out, very few uh, seek surgery. And there's a large clinical need for an effective treatment that is less invasive than surgery. With this treatment class, and that being the minimally invasives, a significant proportion of men with bladder outlet obstruction who have stopped medical therapy can be treated prior to impending bladder dysfunction. You know, our THART leaders are, are starting to wrap their heads around this. I think we as urologists have to start to be a little bit less lazy, stop handing out the medicines, start to think about other types of interventions. I think that, you know, these bladder failures in my point, in, in my opinion, it's from us. It's from us urologists not being as aggressive with our patients as we should be. And as these side effects in these long-term studies that are coming up, although they may be small, you know, percentages of patients, they're serious side effects. I didn't even get into the, the, the risk of falling, which is the number one risk of death in the elderly. And one of the top, you know, contributors to that is alpha blockade. So the, the data is piling over and over and over again. I think we have to look upon ourselves to be more aggressive with our, our BPH patients. And when we're having interventions that have such a low risk profile with a very good reward as far as improvement in, in lower urinary tract symptoms, I think we need to start talking about it much, much more. So I ask, you know, are medicines safe or as they, are they as effective as we once thought? Uh, I, I don't think so. And are medicines as safe as we once thought? I definitely do not think so.